the M901 is a vehicle that I feel is very underappreciated. If the Cold War had gone hot, it would have been instrumental in blunting Soviet armored attacks. I was lucky enough to talk to Will, a former M901 crewman, so I hope you guys enjoy the interview. So you were mentioning that you got in on the uh, ITV, but this was before the A1, right? So when right. were you getting, uh, when were you beginning to serve on that vehicle? <clears throat> Let's see. <clears throat> I served, uh, I served on the uh, 901 from roughly 1989 to 1993. I was with Echo Company, 3rd Battalion, 8th Infantry Regiment, uh, 8th Infantry Division. Stationed out of Mainz, Germany, and we were a mechanized division, and uh, most of the companies in my battalion were mechanized on Bradleys, and there was one company, my company, Echo Company, was the anti-tank uh, company of the battalion. And our sister company, uh, 5th Battalion, 8th Infantry Regiment, was actually a mix. It was armor heavy, and they had Abrams. Huh. So the ITV was still being used in the, or the anti-tank platoon was still, the anti-tank company, sorry, was still a part of the force even by that point when most everyone else had transitioned to the BFE. Is there any reason why? So you were in a BFE unit with ITVs or am I missing? Right. Oh. Well, no, it was, it was mainly a mech unit. It was mechanized infantry with just, it, the structure was different then you know nowadays they have like the combat uh, uh brigade combat teams right but back then was the traditional structure where they had uh a a battalion with like four companies and they would have like uh three companies of infantry and then one company of support and one company of anti-tank right Okay, so this is okay. I gotcha. Uh, huh, interesting. Well, so I'm curious because that would mean you're probably one of the last uh, ITVs still in service with the army at that point. Uh, yeah, yeah. It wasn't long after that they, uh, you know, my. Hold on a second. <laughs> my uh, the Eighth Entry Division was disbanded. Um, in the uh, uh, early mid '90s, so it wasn't uh, they they stopped using the 901s around that time. Huh. Okay. And what I've actually there were quite a few complaints from what I heard about the original M901, at least when it first came into service, of like teething issues of it being excessively cramped, underpowered, unreliable, things of that nature. Uh, can you speak to any of that, or is that mostly just rumor mill? Um, no, I I think that there's some credence to to those rumors. I mean, it's it's only as cramped as uh, how much equipment you want to bring with you. Uh, we would fill ours when we would go on our exercises down in southern Germany, down to Hohenfels and Grafenbeer. Um we would take as much equipment as we could, you know, extra MREs, things like that. And of course the inside of the vehicle, you have uh, a lot of the inside is dedicated to your ammo storage and also the ground mount system, because if something ever happened to your, to your uh, uh, turret, you'd want to be able to take your <clears throat> tripod and your missile guidance system and your launch tube and your collimator and your day sight and night sight out of the vehicle and set it up a distance away. So a lot of that equipment was in there um, taking up space, but there was enough for the four of us. That's good to hear at least. Uh, I was living in combinations inside that vehicle. Did you actually live inside the vehicle or did you, for the most part, try and find ways to live outside of it? Uh, we lived inside the vehicle. And how was that? Were you ever like sleeping inside the vehicle or was that a challenge? That that was a challenge because, you know, when you're out doing your uh, little war games and everything, um, you don't get a lot of sleep to begin with. And the the um, you take turns pulling security outside the vehicle as well. Um, so you do get to to stretch your legs. You know, you get outside, you do your little your little post up 
um, outside of the vehicle to do security. But then you want to get back in uh, as soon as possible so you can sleep on the uh, jumbled boxes of MREs and uh, wait for that one time an hour when the driver will uh, crank the vehicle to charge the batteries. And at that time, he runs the heater full blast. And so what was, in that sense, the most challenging operational environment you had to use the vehicle in? Was it the heat or was it the cold that you were more concerned about uh, in the ITV? It was the mud. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. The The 113 is a great vehicle. Uh, but in my experience, if it even looks at a mud puddle, then you're going to throw a track. Uh, which we happen to have, you know, that happened to us quite a few times down in, in the training areas. And compared to the other vehicles that, at the very least, you've seen, how was replacing a track on the ITV? Was that a somewhat simple affair? Or, I mean, assuming you're in the mud, that's a pretty time-intensive and... Yeah, it is, especially when you're in, you know, knee-deep mud and mud water and... Uh, you've only got the tools at your disposal, your breaker bars, and uh, trying to repin a track. Otherwise, you'd have to wait for the combat engineer vehicles to come around and and uh, kind of scoop you guys up and take you back to the assembly area. Sounds a little bit like a nightmare. Right, so just waiting to happen. Throwing the track would that be maybe because it didn't have um, return rollers, or you have no idea? Uh. I, I don't think it was because of the return rollers. I think it was just the the um, the abuse that we were putting the vehicles through, especially down there. And you have to realize, I mean, this is based off the 113 chassis. So we're trying to keep up with Bradley's and we're trying to keep up with our sister battalion in the Abrams. And yeah. they go tearing across these fields and everything. And uh, we're like, okay, we're kind of like the redheaded stepchildren bring it up the rear you know gotcha well i guess in an itv you wouldn't want to be bringing up the front anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true that's very true one thing uh you mentioned though so you mentioned of course uh the night side as part of the equipment which i think is a is an interesting thing to discuss because i believe that's the uh, taz 4 right and that was right. one of the first thermal imagers ever on any system in the world uh and it was i believe the first heavy ATGM vehicle, the ITV being, the first ATGM vehicle to actually have uh, a thermal imager of any site, sort. Right. But as a result, I'm sure that was also a much more primitive and low resolution capability. So what was your experience with the TAS-4? Well, uh, it always worked. I mean, there were never any problems with it. Uh, in the, the old system, you actually had the dual site. So you had the day site and the night site. So if the night you always wanted to try to uh, acquire with the day site and then you wanted to switch up to the night site and track and engage with the night site, uh, which kind of at first seems counterintuitive, but the day site is so much clearer than the night site. So you did have the two sites. They were kind of cumbersome and you had to align them to each other. <clears throat> which you know took took some practice and it took some patience but once you got them aligned to each other you, pretty much whatever you looked at with the day site you could see with the night site well that's good to hear i mean from what i heard or what i was hearing about the uh, taz 5 which was for the dragon uh completely different system but there were a lot of complaints about it just being a very cumbersome and very finicky very fragile system also very noisy apparently but yeah. uh, what I was curious about is that, <clears throat> so, you know, in doctrine and manuals and everything, they're mentioning by the book that it's only for low visibility or nighttime use. But in practice, I was hearing a lot more about people actually using it, even in daytime, high visibility conditions, just for tracking uh, after firing. Is that sort yeah. of more your experience? Yeah, yeah. If the conditions were good, you know, the day site, like I said, you could, you could, you could just use the day site for picking out, uh, say, like objects. Just, I mean, you're trying to look, you know, five kilometers downrange. 
So uh, if you can pick up any kind of heat signatures with that night sight at that distance, then, you know, more so the better uh, you you do that. You you just stick with the night sight. But, yeah. So it wasn't a system that, in practice, was exclusively limited to low visibility or nighttime use. It was still something you would use at long range conditions just to acquire a target. Right, during the daytime, yeah. Okay, well, <clears throat> and of course, you know, the M901, I think not a lot of people realize the context behind that vehicle. That's a vehicle coming into service, you know, 1979, 1980, alongside the, the M6083, the M113A2, and a bunch of other uh, systems, which are all pretty innovative for the U.S. Army at that time. And that's coming on the cusp of many, many, many procure procurement failures through the 1970s. So, like, the ITV... M68-3 and similar vehicles are really the first time in maybe six years you have the Army actually procuring a system effectively. And one of the big selling points of that is the proliferation of thermals, thermal imagers, even to the platoon mm -hmm. and squad level. Um, what I'm curious, though, is that it's mentioned that uh, things like the, the TAS-4 and TAS-5 could be dismounted from the vehicle and used independently as basically a uh, reconnaissance aid was that something that you ever did or uh <laughs> used or did you ever dismount the system from the vehicle like the actual launcher itself or was that really not no no it? no like i said earlier we would have um <clears throat> we inside the vehicle in case the vehicle ever goes down you have the complete ground mount system so you did have extra sites you didn't have, have to take them out of the turret if you didn't want to um so you'd have the day sight, the night sight. You had a collimator, which was used to align both the day sight and the night sight to each other. Uh, you had a tripod. You had a traversing unit. You had the uh, uh, missile guidance system slash, you know, battery pack. And uh, you would take all of this out of the vehicle, and then you, you would just set it up. You know, you could set it up in like three or four minutes. Uh, and then get your alignment going on your day site, night site. That would take, you know, roughly a minute or so if you were really good. And uh, then you'd have a whole ground mount system. Uh, you'd so be not, you'd so be on level ground. You'd, you'd really want a fighting position uh, to put that in. But if you didn't have time to prepare for, for that, then, yeah, you could just throw everything on the ground, get it all set up, and fight from a, a ground position like that. Was that something you ever did in war games, or was that just something that you trained on to do? Uh, yeah, we we would always make it a point uh, to to practice doing that as much as we could because you know you don't. It's nice to rely on the vehicle when it's there and when it works, but you know what? If it's not, then you're kind of SOL. So you do want to be able to fight from a different position. Hmm. So, because <clears throat> I know one of the major uh, selling points of the ITV over the M150, the um, predecessor tow vehicle, was that you have this large hammerhead turret, of course, and you can perform uh, deflate fire from a semi-protected right. position. My question is, how did that end up working uh, in war games or in training? Was that something that was very useful or was that more of a... Was that something that required too much positioning to really be advantageous uh, in a war game situation? Well, if you're... <clears throat> what we what we trained for most of the time in Germany was prepared defense. Mm. Um, so we, we would go in, we would have the uh, combat engineers come in with their bulldozers and they would they would dig us out uh, fighting positions so we could go hold down. And uh, we would prepare the position, you know, to the front, to the sides and to the rear with any kind of camouflage that we needed. So pretty much the only thing, you know, popping up would be the turret. Uh, the commander could come up out of his hatch also, you know, and he could, he could post up and see over the top of the berm. But yeah, you wanted to have a, a fighting position if you could if not then yeah you're going to be fighting uh uh on the back of the slope 
of backslope defense. And luckily with that turret depression, you know, you could just peek over and hope nobody sees you and do your thing and then shoot and scoot. And how reliable was that turret? That's something that I've heard a little bit of contention on that apparently might not have been a wholly reliable system, at least initially. Maybe initially, but I don't recall ever having any problems with the turret, with the, with the sights, with the launch tubes, with the traverse mechanism, with you know, anything. Uh, I don't recall ever having any problems with it. Good to hear. Well, so of course you said you got in, uh, 89 on the ITV. And of course that's still, you know, height of the cold war, arguably. Um, what was doctrine like when you were learning and getting acquainted with this vehicle? What were some of the quirks that might not have carried over into a more modern, uh, tank destroyer doctrine, if we were to call it that? that you were familiarized with on the ITV in 1989? Well, uh, yeah, it has changed so much. I mean, back then, even in the 90s, we're still trying trying to stop the Russian bear, uh, especially in, in Germany and Europe and Central Europe. Um, so you're, you're training and you're preparing for these huge uh, assaults of armor and infantry fighting vehicles coming uh, from the east and, uh, you know, finding routes where you, you, you know, you pick your fighting positions and then you have routes where you withdraw and go to alternate fighting positions and uh, setting up around villages and towns and things like that. And that's you know, from, from what my experience is, that's really not the case anymore. I mean, what kind of a large army besides, you know, somebody like China or, or, or whatever, are we going to, are we going to fight on an open battlefield like that? You know, I, I can't foresee it. Uh, it's kind of foreign to me when I got, when I got called up, uh, to go to Iraq, I joked, you know, the, I was one of the older guys that that was uh, with with the guys that were called up, and I would joke because even when we went to like machine gun, you know, when we would go fire the M two forty Bravo out on the range, I was taught when you pull the trigger, you you say die, commie die, and then you let up on the trigger. And so I did that, and a lot of the uh, instructors that were there were like Duncan. What are you talking about? And I would say, look, that's how I learned what the proper burst is, you know, but, but there's no such thing anymore. So it's kind of foreign. It's tribal knowledge at that point. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And so, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned, of course, the U.S. has no major uh, adversary where fighting over an open field is really a practical thing, but... For other nations, uh, for other, well, you know, current conflicts, as we've well seen, is there a an argument to be made for a vehicle like the ITV, which is dedicated as a separate attachment in an anti-tank capacity? Or has that role mostly been supplanted uh, by the Bradley or comparable vehicles? I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's obsolete. I think that it's back back in its day yeah you want to talk about mobility okay you've got a tracked vehicle you've got a tracked vehicle that can engage and destroy enemy heavy armor um at almost four kilometers one shot one kill death by wire whatever you want to call it uh you know i can make my shot and cover that distance in 21 seconds and pretty much get a kill with it but that's mobility then. That's not mobility now. Mobility now, and you're talking about technology upgrades too. The like the javelin, the javelin can do just what our vehicle did. It's a hell of a lot more portable. Uh, I think it's a hell of a lot more effective, um, and it's a hell of a lot cheaper. So instead of needing an entire 
vehicle tracked or not you just need right. a couple guys on the back of a humvee get out to a good that's position. right that's right so you had mentioned uh i believe you know this is somewhat not a, a direct question but it was you mentioned uh about doctrine of engaging helicopters can you talk to speak more to that and what that was like and <clears throat> what that condition was yeah that that was fun um Every time we would go down to Grafenbeer and Hohenfels, you know, at least once a year, and we would train. A lot of the times we would train with um, the Black Horse uh, Regiment, the 11th ACR, and they would have their engineers prepare us positions uh, on a valley that runs north south, roughly in the Fulda Gap area of Germany. And uh, we would position on one side of a, of this deep, you know, valley, looking across at the ridge line of the valley on the other side, and, you know, just picking out uh, points of interest, target uh, reference points, things like that. And uh, as part of the, the exercises, of course, we had the aviation regiment that would come through uh, with their OH-58s. And they would actually fly through low through the valleys and doing their whole trying to find a position to pop up and scan for targets for the cobras, you know, that were following them, a pair of cobras. And so every time, and it wasn't really, I mean, it, it wasn't rule of law written anywhere that you had to do this, but we did it as practice. You would always try to acquire these helicopters because they were flying low and slow and they would have miles gear on them the same that we had miles gear the laser engagement system uh, with the whoopee light on the vehicle and everything and so you would practice acquiring and tracking this low slow moving helicopter and taking taking a shot at it taking a couple of shots at it uh we of course don't know if we ever hit they would always just fly off but uh, it was good practice. You could definitely hit with with a with a tow missile and take them out. Well, I know that uh, especially in the early '80s, the uh, U.S. Army was very concerned about the prevalence of uh, like the Hind, you know, the Hind D starting to come into service, uh, yeah. and that was very much not something that, with the current air defense artillery assets, that were you know the Chaparral was great. The VADs was okay, but they weren't distributed widely enough where the Army was confident they could stop a dedicated hind push. So I'm curious if you ever heard any uh, comments about how ITVs or other ATGM vehicles might have to be providing that sort of short-range air defense in a some capacity. Or is that more just something that you all did on your own initiative because you had the opportunity to do so? Yeah, I think it was just an opportunity kind of thing. It's it's uh, you don't know if you're ever going to run into that situation, and I don't know that. Looking back at it now, I don't know that I would ever try to engage a hind uh, with a tow missile because number one, you don't want to be seen, right? And if I take a pot shot at him, this this is the flying tank. Uh, if I take a pot shot at him and miss. He may see where that that uh, engagement came from, and he's just going to lay waste to us. We had it in the back of our minds that if we were to ever do this, it would probably be some kind of a scout helicopter or maybe a transport helicopter. Okay, so not something that could shoot back at you with any... Yeah, no, 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 no. One thing huh. I'm curious about is I've seen a lot of different figures for average reload time for the uh, hammerhead launcher what do you think was probably the fastest you could reload that well I want to say anywhere from like a single tube well let's just do the double tube so the loader I started out as a loader mm -hmm. and eventually worked my way up to gunner um Sitting in the back there, you got the cue 
uh, from the engagement sequence, you know, you're you're listening to everybody else. You're hearing the the uh, uh, vehicle commander give out target engagement instructions. You're hearing the gunner. Um, luckily, we weren't in a tank, so we didn't have different kinds of ammo. We just had you know a missile. So as soon as that second tube is fired, that launcher pops backwards, and you had this big chain across the uh, troop compartment door on the roof and so you would yank on that chain and that would pop up to its first position which aligned with the turret uh, that was reclining backwards so when the loader popped his head up out of the hatch he still had at least some overhead protection mm -hmm. from like artillery fragments or, or shells or anything like that and so you would, would pop the lever take out the old tube and just throw it over the side of the vehicle and then you could take the tube that you had from the inside of the vehicle uh mounted to the to the uh uh to the wall of the vehicle and you would slide that up it would instantly make as long as you kind of clicked it in position it would make that electrical connection and then you would lock it into place so it wasn't very long i mean to do one side probably no more than like I would say like 10 to 15 seconds, depending on if you had everything standing by. Gotcha. Well, and of course, since this is uh, you know pre A1, this is the original ITV. I'm assuming you're using pretty much exclusively the ITO. Uh, did you ever use any of the older toes? So like Beto, you know, the old, 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 old toes, or is that completely incompatible with the system you're using? No, they're they're compatible. Um, we use those uh, what we call war shots, I guess. Um, I I use two war shots, um, and they're they're mainly to get them out of storage uh, and to get rid of them. And it's good training. I mean, you can train on a system all you want, but if you never fire a live shot you're kind of not getting the whole experience. I mean, you wouldn't know that when you press that fire button or that fire trigger that you're going to hear a really loud sound in your ear that is the gyros spinning up first before the missile even fires. And then the, the heat, the smoke, the smell, the sound of those launch motors kicking off and then when they cut out and that flight motor cuts in, I mean, it can surprise you if you've never fired it before. Uh, so, yeah, we would take some of the, the older missiles. We would always go to storage and check um, check the depots. And you had to check. I remember the, the one thing you, you had to check was the humidity sensor. There were like hum little humidity um uh, circles on each of the missile tubes and you would look and and make sure that there was no humidity in there and then that means okay that's an old one you can get rid of uh or we can use to fire or whatever so we did take the old ones and we would fire those we would use those in training and fire them on the range and you know since these are fairly old missiles by that point did anyone in your company ever experience a uh, failure to launch where the missile would either just pop out and not initiate or just fail to launch in, in the first place? Uh, call us lucky. No, I, I've never experienced a failure. Uh, nobody in my, in my uh, company, I think ever experienced a failure. They were, we, you know, we practiced uh, misfires and, and failure to fires, but, yeah, we, we never had a failure. It's pretty lucky. <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't shoot a whole lot of live rounds, you know, but uh, from what I what I remember, uh, you know, we would probably shoot maybe five or six every every year. And you mentioned that you got to fire too. So was that you were actually the gunner for that or did you only ever load uh, two? Well, I, you know, b both. Uh, so yeah, loading and uh, also 
the two that I actually fired, one was in basic training or advanced training, actually, before I even got to Germany uh, as part of a demonstration for family members. And then another one actually over in Germany. And so how was the uh, accuracy? How was your accuracy with those uh, live fire rounds? Was the disorientation of the sound, the smell, the noise enough to cause any suitable uh, impact to accuracy? Or was it something you were mostly able to overcome pretty quickly? If you, if you kind of just grit your teeth and don't panic, um, the accuracy is, I mean, there was a reason why we took the moniker from the snipers. It's one shot, one kill. Uh, so yeah, I can, I can put this dart down range, uh, close to four kilometers, like I said, in 21 seconds or less and pretty much be guaranteed a hit as long as you don't panic, you know, don't, don't be too, too rough on the controls. You know, you want the, what, what's the old saying that they have, uh, 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 slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So. Sorry. I'm hold on one sec. I'm trying to. Okay. Uh, huh. Well, so <clears throat> I'm curious then, you know, so you're mentioning the humidity of these old missiles, these uh, live fire rounds, and apparently you know, no misfires at all. But one issue that I had heard, and again, this is initially, this is 1980 evaluations from crews, but apparently the ITV had issues with um, sealing up from rain, debris, and apparently moisture had a tendency to get inside the vehicle. Was that something you ever experienced, or was that mostly a resolved issue by the time you were using it? I think I think that was a a pretty pretty resolved issue. I I don't remember ever hearing about anything like, like that. I mean, you we we're again working with some of these you know quote unquote newer vehicles, uh, these Abrams and these Bradleys, and they are. They are more robust when it comes to operating in a nuclear biological chemical environment, <clears throat> which would also uh, lend itself to the thinking that, all right, it's going to be a little more resistant to rain and moisture and, and things like that. But let's face it. I mean, these are combat vehicles. Things are going to get in where you don't want them to get in. Things are going to get dirty that you don't want to get dirty. Things are going to get wet that you don't want to get wet. But for the most part, I mean, it kept us dry when when we wanted to be dry. It kept us warm, you know, when we wanted to be warm. So uh, I don't remember there ever being a problem with exposure to the elements uh, uh, on the inside, the, the electronics, the mechanical components, anything like that. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, I mean, the initial, it was interesting. Oh. Because because I had had you know, this impression of what the ITV was or how how it performed. And then this report, at least by early crews, was pretty scathing in a lot of ways. Um, but it seemed like it mellowed out over the years after its initial deployment. Um, because these vehicles were procured under pretty much an immediate need uh, requirement. So they weren't actually going through their initial testing or evaluation. They were just being procured almost straight into service. Um, right. One thing I am curious about then is that what would you summarize your overall feelings or impressions of the ITV as, you know, compared to other vehicles that you've seen or that you've been in? Uh, how does the ITV stack up? Well, uh, I want to say it's the um, it's it's the old Ford that you that you find in the field and you want to fix up and you want to restore to all of its glory i mean it was old even by the time the itv came out I, you you know as well as i do you guys know the 113 was a great platform uh for modifying i mean anywhere from the itv going back to the a cab vehicles to command vehicles to the 588s um you could pretty much do anything with the 113 uh that you could 
but even by the time I was in, it was kind of a, a niche vehicle because, you know, let's face it, you've got the Bradleys and the Bradleys have their own uh, uh, tow launchers now. So we, we were feeling kind of obsolete even by that time. Uh, the 113 is still a great platform, but definitely showing its age, especially by the time that I was in. Well, that's mostly what I got, at least. But uh, I'm curious, Alex, do you have anything else that you would like to cover or go over? I'm going to turn my mic off briefly because there's some uh, axe grinding in the background, and I don't want that to bleed through. Uh, I think you got everything, okay. mostly. There were a few points where I wanted to try and butt in, but you are so fast with the questions. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm good. All right. Well, do you, I, uh, you know... I guess maybe to ask sort of your age-old question, Alex, of do you have any stories that you can sort of fondly fondly reminisce on uh, or experiences with the ITV that you think are worthwhile uh, sharing? The the Within the first week that I was in Germany, I'm still getting shown around. Go down to the motor pool to get introduced to my track that I'm going to be a, a loader on. I start out as a loader. I'm like, okay, great. Fresh out of basic advanced training, going down. Here I am, 18 years old. I'm I'm on top of the world. Go down, and some of the guys are working on some of the suspension components of the vehicle. I help. I don't. I'm not trained on it. I don't know. I this is the first time I've seen this vehicle, and uh, they tell me, okay, they're they're pretty much done, and they just need to to test it out. Okay, any way I can help, let me know. Well, Duncan, why don't you go ahead and climb up on top of the vehicle? Okay, I'm up on top of the vehicle. All right, now start jumping up and down. we got to see how much it's going to bounce. Okay, no problem. So I start jumping up and down, and I swear I'm jumping up and down for like 45 seconds trying to make this vehicle bounce. And we've got the rest of the guys that are gathered around it's just one of the new guy kind of things, you know. Here I am thinking that I'm going to make this vehicle move, and of course it's not going to budge. So almost a bit of a, a hazing ritual, if you will. Yeah, one of many. Ah. Uh, well, I appreciate you coming out to talk with us. So I hope you guys enjoy the interview. I thought it was very insightful. As always, if you guys have suggestions for video topics, leave them in the comments, and I'll see you on the next one.